So good morning everyone. Welcome to an incredible journey that we're going to go on today. It's going to be a journey through our gastrointestinal tract. It's a journey that will open your eyes. It's a journey that most people are ignorant about. And I find that whenever this is presented, people get very excited. Because how many people say, I've got a sore tummy? Well, there's no tummy down there. The, the tummy's up here. Many people don't realize where the different organs in their body are. And when you are ever presenting to the guests, always keep it very, very simple. We're going to go a little bit complicated today. But as I have mentioned to you before, I need to go very deep with you so that you understand why you present the, the skim or the light things that you do. So I'd like to begin with a couple of Bible verses, Romans 12, 1 and 2, which I'm sure we all know. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, <coughs> to present <coughs> excuse me, your bodies living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. But be not conformed to this world. What does this world do? Eat all day long? <laughs> Eat anything they want? But there are certain laws that govern the functioning of the gastrointestinal tract. There are certain laws that when you adhere to them, everything runs well. But when you break them, you get disharmony. And do you remember that that uh, statement we looked at page 100 of uh, education on Sabbath, where it says, to transgress his law, whether it be physical, mental or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to invite discord, anarchy and ruin. Breaking the laws that govern the gut can cause many problems. And when you break the laws that govern the gut, you can even go to the point of defiling your body. And 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, know you not that ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. Sorry, no, that's not it. I've mixed it up with the next one. Let's go back again. 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 16 and 17, know you not that ye are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Because the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. There are many who are diligently keeping those laws, but they're actually defiling this temple of God because of what's happening in here. Digestion begins in the mouth. Now it's in the mouth and it's in the mouth only that I myself and I, here's the I word again, I am the one that chooses and this is what I choose regarding the mouth. I choose what goes in. Is that right? I choose how long it stays in the mouth. Is that right? And the only exposed bone in the body is the teeth. And we should chew, chew, chew. Dr. Kellogg said, if you only chew a nut a few times, all those little lumps of nut, guess what happens? They come out the other end. Mm -hmm. You haven't been able to access the nutrients that are in that nut. We should be chewing food until it's a liquid. You've probably heard that old saying, we should, we should drink our food and chew our drinks. <laughs> and when our guests are fasting, we always ask them to put the juice in their mouth, put the glass down and swish it around in their mouth a few times and then swallow. And what's swishing any liquid in your mouth a few times is it warms a little bit. If you drink something very cold and, and fast, don't you often get a headache? <laughs> and you know what the stomach has to do now? Warm it up <laughs> because it's not going to let that cold fluid go into your warm body, your warm blood. You know what that means? On a really hot day drinking cold water, can make you hotter because your body has to expend energy to heat, heat that up. So we have say over how long it's in there. We have say over how often it goes in. 
Is it going in every two hours? Or is it going in with periods between? We also have say over the environment of entry. Ellen White says, cast off care and anxious thought when you sit, do dine. In other words, no controversial issues are to be discussed at the table. We also choose whether we drink with our meals or whether we drink between our meals. And you'll find out what happens when we drink with our meals as we get down to the next organ of digestion, which is the mouth. So it is in the mouth where I choose what goes in, when it goes in, how long it's in the mouth, the environment of entry, I choose that. And what I choose affects everything all the way down. And the last one is, I choose how much. <laughs> Do I eat this much? or this much, or this much. <laughs> That's why if I do eat at night, and I don't always eat at night. Remember, paupers sometimes don't eat. If I do eat at night, it is very light. It is very small. But in the morning and at lunch, I eat substantial meals. So how much? Now, did you get those five? I choose what goes in, I choose how much goes in, I choose when it goes in, I choose how long it stays in the mouth, and I choose the environment where I eat. So if someone's very, very busy, very, very busy, and very, very hungry, and they've got a whole lot on, do you know what I say? Have a smoothie. Have a smoothie. You, you, you need something, or even some almond milk with maybe a little bit of protein powder in it and a touch of stevia. But you, you need something. But when you're this busy and this fast, you, you, if you eat in a rush, you won't digest properly, as we will see. The mouth has a pH that is alkaline. And the mouth, and most people don't realise, there are two. Th the mouth is where digestion begins, and only two different foods are digested in the mouth. Now I know I am guilty of information overload. Can it, can anyone remember the fat that is broken down in the mouth, the saturated fat? Yeah. So the enzyme, the enzyme that breaks down saturated fat. Saturated fat is the only fat that's broken down in the mouth. And it's, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to put that there. That's supposed to have a heading and the heading is the food. So these are our headings. We're going to be looking at whether what its pH is, what the enzyme is and what the food is. The food is saturated fat. And the enzyme that breaks down the saturated fat is lingual lipase. Lingual lipase is released from the sublingual gland that sits underneath the tongue. And lingual lipase breaks down saturated fat. And that should be organ. Sorry, I got talking at breakfast time when I should have been drawing up my board. <laughs> so the organ we're looking at is mouth. Is anything else broken down in the mouth? We're coming to the time of the week where I'm starting to ask you questions. Starch. Aha, starch, yes. Starch is broken down in the mouth or it could be carbohydrates. You could call it carbohydrates. Do you remember what breaks it down? It's a salivary amylase and it's called tylen. P-T-Y-L-I-N. Or in some, and we better be correct here, in some anatomy and physiology books, it's an A and an N, tylen. So 
So tylen, breaks down, starch. And when does tylen appear, students? When the molars are through. When the molars are through. And this is why we never feed babies starches. So now we're coming through the little valve here and this little valve is called the cardiac sphincter. Cardiac refers to the heart and of course it's not the heart but it's, it's called the cardiac sphincter because it's very close to the cardiac muscle which is the heart right next to the so it's right next to the 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 cardiac muscle so it's called the cardiac sphincter notice how many layers that this little sphincter has two it has two layers and you'll find a lot of people come to the health retreat unfortunately that have reflux heartburn because when you get into the stomach which is the next organ so students, what pH is the stomach? Acid. Acid. In fact, it's the only part of the body that should be acid. Every other part of the body should be alkaline. The only other acid part of the body is waste. When waste is coming out of the body, um, that's acid. So the stomach is an acid environment. And we'll look at what happens in this acid environment in a middle, in a minute. But sometimes acid comes up and it's called uh, reflux or heartburn. It's called heartburn because it's coming up and it feels like your heart's burning. And I have friends, doctors, nurses who worked in casualty or you call it emergency, I think. And people come in thinking they're having a heart attack, but it's actually heartburn because it, it's, it's right close there. Now that muscle, remember what the cardiac sphincter is? It's a muscle. It sits right in the middle of your diaphragm. So it's basically sitting right there. Being a muscle and sitting in the middle of your diaphragm, it is of the utmost important to keep your core muscles strong because if you keep your core muscles strong, that will automatically strengthen that cardiac muscle. Now, I haven't met anyone who said that their doctor talked to them about keeping their core muscle strong for heartburn. So our muscles must be strong. Our core muscles. That's why every day you should do some sort of core muscle work. Well, once you get your core muscles very strong, you can probably maintain it by doing a core workout maybe three times a week, but you've got to get those, those core muscles strong and that will help with reflux. And because it's a muscle, when it's relaxed, it's closed. And when it tightens, it opens. So if someone's stressed out, anxious, what's going to happen to that little muscle? it will open. And you talk to people with reflux, it gets worse when they're stressed. And God designed our stomach to sleep when we sleep. He designed our stomach that we eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and tea like a pauper. But in Australia, many people have breakfast like a pauper, lunch like a pauper, and the tea is the king and the queen together. And many people say, I just don't have time. So what happens is they have a huge meal at night and then they sit in front of the television and fall asleep. Is that right? And then they get up and go to bed and they find it hard to sleep because there's this huge furnace <laughs> burning up the fuel in the middle of their stomach. And that can't stop because if it stops, your food will rot and it can poison you. And so they lie down and because of gravity... What's, what's getting pushed? It's pushing against that cardiac sphincter. That's why when they feed babies early, you know, too young, before they can sit, they're lying down. Doesn't matter with breast milk. But even when I breastfed my babies, I would keep them upright. 
And here is a little point too while I think of it with breastfeeding babies because you will meet many mothers that you will, will ask you for help. Babies should feed like that. And yet how often are they all wrapped up and they're feeding like this? And when they feed like that, they pull the nipple and put strain on the nipple. And so the baby should feed like that. So if the baby's feeding on the right side, then you put their left arm behind the back. And then the, the other arm, of course, is the front. And have them laying like this. And the mother's sitting up. Now, the only time they were lying down really was in the middle of the night because I used to sleep with all my babies. And when they woke, I just stuck them on and went back to sleep. So it's not that odd time, but mostly that, that will help to protect the nipple from being crapped or being over, overworked when the, when the baby's first born. Um, so the baby should feed like that. I just thought I'd mention that while we're on the subject, yes? Does that mean the baby's sitting on your lap? Well, the baby, you're holding the baby like this and they're basically down like this. Okay. But you're so their, their, their tummy is on your tummy. Mm -hmm. They're lying on you like that. Mm -hmm. So they're not actually sitting, they're basically almost lying on their tummy. Okay. And, and they're upright. But when babies are fed this mush, you know, this mushed up stuff, before they can sit, they're lying down. And yet we should be upright with, with gravity when, when we're feeding. Another reason why feeding babies soft things <laughs> before they have teeth is another reason why it, does, it defies reason. So, to heal reflex. Number one, strengthen the core muscles. Number two, have breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and tea like a pauper. And no drinking with the meals. And I'll show you why that happens. Because we need strong hydrochloric acid to be able to break down our food. And what does water do to acid? Dilutes it. it dilutes it. That's right. That's right. And we have. And the other thing you can do for people with reflux is give them magnesium. Magnesium is a muscle relaxant. So when someone has severe reflux, we give them 500 milligrams of magnesium citrate four times a day before each meal and before they go to bed at night. If they're having three meals before their soup. If they're not having a third meal, you know, they don't have to have it. What kind of magnesium was that? Citrate? Citrate. Yeah. Citrate is a an, um, very absorbable form of... That's, uh, that sounds uh, quite a lot because I know that uh, magnesium, uh, if you uh, owe oh, any magnesium, you, you can die from it. Oh, we give it to our guests all the time and they don't die. Yeah. <laughs> so, I hope so. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, it's all right. <laughs> now, this is quite a strong dose, but as they, as they manage that, then you lessen it off. You see that? It's like eucalyptus oil. Do you know in 1976 a little one drank some eucalyptus oil and went into a coma, so they banned eucalyptus oil. There was such an uproar about it that they do sell it now, but it's got poison on the glass. How many people die from alcohol? Quite a lot. That's right. And stories of young men being dead, you know, someone dares them to drink a bottle of scotch a night and, and they're dead within a couple of hours, but they haven't banned alcohol yet, have they? No. So when you say the magnesium might kill you, I thought, where'd that one come from? Where do you think that one might have come from? Yeah. You know, the third killer in the world today is uh, pharmaceutical. Yeah. And this is not just medical mistakes. So we're, now we're coming into the stomach. One more thing, we had a guest who had an ulcerated esophagus because the acid was coming up so much. So she's given antacids. You know what I say, what's going to break down the protein now? So what does she need? She needs to have breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, tea like a pauper. 
strengthen the core muscles, magnesium to close that, and then a herb that will coat and soothe and heal the lining of the gut. Students, what would be the best herb? Not cane pepper. <laughs> it has a place. Chamomile tea, we can relax them, but slippery elm. Remember what it does? Coats, soothes and heals the lining of the gut. Now, when someone has been on uh, um, medication to stop, the, uh, to stop the acid for a long time, what they're now showing is that it can cause colon cancer because the food's getting down there not broken down properly. And as you'll see when we get down here, more bacteria has to be created to try and deal with that. But I did meet a man who had conquered his, uh, his, his reflux. He'd been on Nexium for 25 years. That's a most common drug that they give for that. And he conquered it with cane pepper. So there we are, he conquered it with cane pepper. How did cane pepper conquer it? It boosted his hydrochloric acid because he'd been on this inhibitor for so long, then the cane pepper boosted it, yes? And it must have also increased the blood flow for him, have to heal. But That's you, true. I, I would suggest uh, aloe vera or slippery elm. Yes, aloe vera or slippery elms can certainly coat <clears throat> and soothe the healing of that. If they take a glass of slippery elm and it's still hurting in half an hour, we'll take another one. It's a very safe herb. So let me show you the lining of the stomach. The lining of the stomach looks like this, big folds, big folds. And they are lined with gastric glands. And two thirds of those gastric glands, so that's two thirds, about that much, release mucus. And what that mucus does is it causes a thick wall to be covering the, the lining of the stomach to protect it from what's released here. So what's released here is hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid could burn a hole in your skin. What's also released, and these are the little glands called parietal glands, what's also released is pepsinogen. And when hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen unite, they release pepsin. And pepsin is the enzyme that breaks down protein. It starts protein breakdown. Did you know that's the only thing that's broken down in the stomach? Nothing else. So the, the saturated fat, it starts the process in the mouth. The starch starts under the action of tylen. And then when it comes into the, the acid environment of the stomach, that's put on hold. And in the acid environment, that's where protein starts its breakdown. But the union of the hydrochloric acid and the pepsinogen can only happen in a very acid environment. And the pepsin will only work in a very acid environment. So if the person's drinking with their meals and watering all of this down, it's, it's very difficult for that to happen. There's something else that's released in the uh, parietal glands, and that is the intrinsic factor. What's the intrinsic factor? The intrinsic factor is required to absorb vitamin B12. So what I'd like to do now is I want to give you the vitamin B12 story. <clears throat> my thumb is going to be vitamin B12, and my Finger is going to be R protein. In food, B12 is tied up with R protein. They're linked together. Now, when B12 and R protein come into the stomach, the hydrochloric acid breaks that union. So now, I, my B12 is free from my R protein. And in the stomach, the intrinsic factor is released. 
So let's say this is intrinsic factor. So now all the way down the small intestine, B12 and intrinsic factor float down and then come into the last part of the small intestine, which is the ileum. Intrinsic factor and B12 connect. And when intrinsic factor and B12 connect, then they're absorbed into what's called the enterohepatic circulation. I'll write that down for you. Enterohepatic circulation. So what's the enterohepatic circulation? Hepatic is liver. So the enterohepatic circulation is a, is, a, is a circuit that goes between the liver and the ileum. And as your body needs B12, it'll be pulled out of that and used. But if your body doesn't need the B12, it basically just stays in circulation. And you know what this means? You can have no B12 in your diet for 30 years before you show a deficiency. So if someone is continually showing a B12 deficiency, it could be low hydrochloric acid that can't break the R protein from the, from the B12. It could be low intrinsic factor because if you don't have the intrinsic factor, you can't absorb your B12. So if someone has low B12, what should we be asking? Why? Why? That's why one of the first supplements people will be given if they have low B12 is sublingual B12. So it'll go straight into the bloodstream and won't require the intrinsic factor. B12 is a bacteria. So you'll find it in cultured foods like the sauerkrauts, miso. You'll find it being an airborne bacteria. If you pick, um, it's like yesterday, I went out and I picked oregano. And the oregano is clean. And I pick it, I chopped it up just before I, we served it. You got some B12 in your lentil stew. Now, if I had just put manure on my garden, I would wash it. <laughs> if the cats had been on that garden, I would wash it. But what's B12? It's a bacteria. If I eat an apple straight off the tree, I'm getting B12. If I eat a strawberry straight out of the garden, I'm getting B12. Dr. Neil Nedley, in his book, Proof Positive, he has the research in there that shows that B12 is found in organically grown root vegetables. We probably got some in our potatoes yesterday. You don't need much B12. If a person continually shows low B12, can you see you've got to put your detective hat on and find out, now why is this happening? That's the B12 story. So you asked yesterday if you need to give your baby B12. No, as long as the mother has good amounts of B12, it will come. So hydrochloric acid has a few roles in the body. So I'd like to show you the few roles. One is absolutely it connects with pepsinogen to produce pepsin and pepsin breaks down your protein. But hydrochloric acid is also, and this is important to understand this, <clears throat> it's antifungal, it's antimicrobial, it's antibacteria. And in my book, Self Heal by Design, I've got a chapter where I say the stomach's secret weapon, and it's hydrochloric acid. If someone says, I have too much acid in my stomach, I say, praise God, you'll break your protein down well. Because there's no such thing as someone having too much acid. 
Dogs have 10 times the hydrochloric acid that humans have. Have you seen what dogs eat? <laughs> Rotten things. <laughs> Cows that are were killed a week ago and they're all rotten. Have you seen what they do? And you notice that they don't die? Have you ever wondered why they don't die? They've got 10 times the hydrochloric acid that humans have. And they don't die. So if you happen to eat something that has a bit of pathogenic bacteria or fungus in it, and you've got strong hydrochloric acid, It'll deal with it. So I'm going to tell you a story. This is a true story. I've heard references to this story. I read about it in a magazine and I found the name of the book and the author and I got our office girl to see if she could find it for me. And Amazon found it in a state college library in the US. They charged me 20 cents because it was written in 1833. And they sent me the book, cost me $20 by the time I got it. It's called uh, Observations and Experiments on the Physiology of Digestion by Dr. William Beaumont. So let me tell you the story that started this book. Dr. William Beaumont was called to an accident in a trading store. And this would have been probably uh, going from the 1700s to the 1800s. A young man called Alexis St. Martin had sustained a gunshot wound to his stomach. He was only, I think, 18 at the time. Dr. Beaumont tended the young man because part of his ribs had been blown out, part of the, his side had been blown out, into his stomach. And he said the man would not live, but they took him to hospital and patched him up the best they could. But the young man got better. Every day he'd get stronger and stronger. And I think it took about six weeks, two months, and the young man was healed, but he had a hole in his stomach, and it was like a mouth, and it had like a flap of skin over it. In the book that I have, there's a pencil drawing of, of what it looked like, and it was basically about here. And... One, more, one picture showed what it looked like in the morning. So here's the hole. And the folds were, were like this. <laughs> and then when he started to eat and the muscular cramping brought it in so it basically just looked like that. So Dr. Beaumont saw his opportunity and asked Alexis St. Martin if he would come home and he could live with Dr. Beaumont and do simple things around the house, and he would pay him a small wage. But Dr. Bowman wanted to do experiments. And what he did was he'd get a piece of silk thread, he'd put a piece of food on it, and he'd put it in the hole. After an hour, he'd pull it out, After, back in. After another hour, pull it out. <coughs> so he kept doing this. And this research changed the, changed the world's view on digestion. So at that time, they thought digestion was more a mechanical process. And now they saw that it was a chemical process. And in his book, it's meticulously documented, all his research. Though the first third of the book tells the story of the Alexis St. Martin, he actually totally healed, except for this hole in his stomach. Dr. Beaumont said he could have stitched it, but he said, no, I don't want anything else to happen. You know, I, leave it. I can live with it. And so he, um, he went out, he married, he, he lived till he was 80. And he probably would have lived longer if he hadn't got too much into the alcohol. But what I found very interesting, there were five things that caused the stomach to hold the food longer than it should. And what Dr. Beaumont found was that digestion averaged three and a half to four hours. And he was experimenting on him for years. Three and a half to four hours. And then the stomach loves a rest of one to two hours. 
because as we go through this, you'll see that the main part of digestion is not the stomach, it's further down. So even when the stomach's empty, you're still observing, absorbing nutrients down here. You don't have to eat when the stomach's empty. And the stomach likes a rest, so it can make more intrinsic factor, more hydrochloric acid, more pepsinogen. So what were the five things that caused the stomach to still have food in it eight hours later? If Alexis St. Martin overate. Dr. Beaumont came to the conclusion that there's only so much hydrochloric acid pepsinogen released. If you overburden the stomach, it takes a long time. It's like asking my big strong son to carry a heavy load up the hill. He'll carry it up quite quickly. But you ask me to carry the same load, it might take me eight hours. <laughs> The stomach can only digest so much at a time. So if ever he overate, the food was still in the stomach eight hours late. If he often ate, if he ate between meals. Let me show you what's happening. I'm going to draw the stomach a bit bigger so that I can illustrate because I don't want to mess up my nice gastrointestinal tract there. So here is stomach. So let's say, let's take us right now. Food from breakfast is in the stomach. Pyloric sphincter shuts. The reason why this valve called the pyloric sphincter shuts because there's a lot happening in there and it's not and it's not going to let it out till it's broken down to the right stage. Dr. Beaumont, he suspected there are sensors <laughs> coming out of there that tell when it's ready to come through. And it's not ready yet, it's only been two hours. And after two hours, the person has a biscuit and a uh, cup of tea. How often does that happen? Or maybe a cake or maybe a pasty or maybe they're really healthy and they have a banana and a handful of nuts. Whatever it is, pyloric sphincter was just starting to open, the food was just coming through and it gets the message, quick shut the gate, something's just come in that's not broken down properly. So maybe this joins after a little while. Food's Food has gone through a little bit. Biscuit joins. Pyloric sphincter gets the message. Yep, that's a bit better. We can open now. So, so that's coming, coming through. Maybe we've got this much left. Oh no, it's lunchtime. Lunch comes in. Quick, shut the gate. Something's just come in that's not breaking down. Can you see what happens? Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, there can still be a remnant of breakfast in the stomach. Loma Linda University about 20 years ago did a whole whole lot of research on this very point and they did it on nurses and they found that the nurses ate three meals and just before each meal they tested the stomach contents totally empty. But the next week they did um, breakfast and then a little something mid-morning and then lunch and a little something mid-afternoon, they found remnants of breakfast still in the stomach eh, at the end of the day. This is also important for parents because some people think that you've got to give children little snacks. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I say to parents, be particularly cautious of grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> So when my son uh, married a girl that already had a little boy, I knew I had to bind this little boy to my heart, so I bought a scooter. Do you know what a scooter is? Mm -hmm. uh, two wheels, a plank, um, uh, up there and handlebars, and you scoot. Yeah, scoot along, because he had a scooter. And we'd scoot all around the neighbourhood. They lived in the town. And one day she said, 
oh, can you get a few things from the shop? I said, Leroy, let's scoot to the shop. And off we went. That's why you must be keep, keep fit so you can play with your grandchildren. <laughs> so we went into the shop and little Leroy, I think he was about four, he ran up to the lolly counter, you know, the sweets. I want this one, I want this one, I went this one. And I squatted down <coughs> eye to eye and I smiled. I said, this grandma doesn't do that. <laughs> See what I'm doing, I'm smiling. You know what the smile says? I love you. But it doesn't quite like what's coming out of my mouth. And I said, let's buy some apples and make an apple pie for dinner tonight. So I went and bought apples. He came out smiling, but he didn't get what he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> if you feed the children well so that they have a high fiber, generous protein, and great fats. And remember, the fats are concentrated, you don't need much. <laughs> they will go the distance. And so if halfway between breakfast and lunch they say they're starving, they don't really know what the word means. And it's often one of the body's many cries for water. Give them water, give them a little bit of salt halfway through and then you know what you do with the children? You distract them because children say they're hungry when they're bored. So I would just distract them. I told you the story yesterday of Peter. Hadn't eaten a lot of breakfast because he had to keep leaving the room because he kept crying. <laughs> Notice what I did. Water, maybe a bit of soy milk or carrot juice if you've got it. And then half an hour before the meal, he can sit on the chair and he can eat a carrot and that will take a long, long time. <laughs> but keep it, keep the distance and keep to the meals. Yes? Is tea also, because you mentioned tea, is tea also something that the uh, herb, digest? Herb teas are fine. Herb tea is certainly something you can have between. But what I thank God for now is the most popular way of eating is time-restricted eating. So look up time-restricted eating. It's, it's, it's all the go. It's the, it's the recent fad with eating. And you know what time-restricted eating is? Exactly what Ellen White says. There's a slight difference. They say eat twice in a 24-hour period, six hours apart. Well, what's the problem? The problem is they say eat at one and eat at seven. <laughs> I don't know, if I didn't eat breakfast, I wouldn't be presenting very well right now. <laughs> so one girl said to me, oh, I can't sleep at night. I'm I've got too much in my stomach. I'm starting to fade by 10 in the morning, but I can't eat till one. So she flipped it and she did what basically we're doing here. We're having breakfast at 8.30. We're doing the time-restricted eating. We're having lunch at two, so we're having that 18-hour fast or approximate that to the next day. Now, what the research is showing, have a look at it. Diabetics are conquering their diabetes. People are losing weight. Uh, brain function is increasing because poor old stomach is not being overworked. Some say... You need to take hydrochloric acid supplements as you get older because as you get older, your hydrochloric acid depletes. Why does it deplete? It depletes because the person's eating all day and they're drinking with their milk. <laughs> Poor old age. If you notice, it gets blamed for so many things. So look into the time-restricted eating. And, you know, so as, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we certainly... Are referring a lot to Ellen White, but when you're a, when you're teaching people who who are not Christians, even atheists that don't know Ellen White, um, you know it's really foolish to to present that if they don't know it. Mm -hmm. So then you go to the signs. Yes. But in between, as long as they again on this, I mean they will take over this uh, diet, but in between they still have not enough hydrochloric acid. Some quite often. So you can give the hydrochloric so, acid. So, yes, the hydro, there is a place, but a lot of hydrochloric acid tablets come from the pig's stomach. So what you can do, you can buy betaine hydrochloride. And betaine hydrochloride... Yeah. Betaine hydrochloride comes, is an extract from beetroot. 
and it, it will boost the uh, hydrochloric acid very nicely. So we have a company in Australia that have uh, Digestive Aid and they've got betaine hydrochloride in it. But the next, next ingredient was porcine. That's from the pig's stomach. <laughs> so be careful, you know, read your labels. Would it be sufficient with beetroot powder? No. No, you need to get the... because. The betaine hydrochloride is, is an extract. So how else can you boost hydrochloric acid? Well, we've got to go to the true remedies and make sure that they are having adequate water. Yeah? Yes, we're, we're getting to that. That's, <laughs> that's good. Your liver makes the hydrochloric acid. And yesterday, my liver needed two cups of water to make enough hydrochloric acid for breakfast today. Yesterday, my stomach needed, or my liver, needed two cups of water to make enough hydrochloric acid for lunch today. So if someone's eating three meals a day, they need six glasses of water the day before so the liver can make enough hydrochloric acid. And that's just for the hydrochloric acid. So dehydration. Everyone has a glass of water when I present that. They need to go and, and rest. You can always bring the stomach into the rest lecture. The stomach needs a rest at night and it needs a rest between meals. So I often will weave the stomach into my rest lecture. So what inhibits hydrochloric acid? Yeah? Question. You said um, two glasses of water the day before. <coughs> Is the hydrochloric acid stored somewhere? Liver. In the liver. So the liver makes the hydrochloric acid. And it's stored and when and it, it comes it, in. And it, 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 it uh, feeds it into the, uh, the parietal glands that are right in the dip of the folds in the stomach. So when we strain the liver, can it also help to have more hydrochloric acid? It can, but what is the main thing with the liver making it? Now here's a very interesting point. Your liver will only make as much hydrochloric acid as it made yesterday. There's a yardstick on how much hydrochloric acid to make. So if your hydrochloric acid is low, your liver is going to continually make low hydrochloric acid. Because remember the yardstick? Your liver will only make as much hydrochloric acid as it made yesterday. And that's where betaine hydrochloride, why did I rub it out? Betaine hydrochloride, when you start taking that, then the liver gets the message, oh, there's more hydrochloric acid there. So it starts making more. Did everyone get that or do you want me to repeat it? Betaine hydrochloride. The liver has a yardstick or a measuring stick on how much hydrochloric acid to make every day. And it'll make as much as it made yesterday. So if hydrochloric acid levels are low, it'll continue to make low. But if you take betaine hydrochloride, then the liver gets the message, there's more hydrochloric acid there. So the next day, it'll make more. Is yep. that depending on what you're eating? No. Not at all? No. So it's the same standard every year, that, uh, every day? That's right, that's okay. right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So it made two cups, you know, let's say for, for illustrate, it, it made a cup yesterday. Well, it'll make an, a cup today because that's how much is in there. But what can exhaust hydrochloric acid is water with the meals, eating all day long, stressed with the meals, because stress, when, when our brain's stressed, the brain sends a message to the stomach, stop making hydrochloric acid. So that's where we get into the laws, yeah? You can boost it in other ways also, or? Yep, well, yep, yep, you can, and one is cane pepper. That'll wake up anything. <laughs> yeah. 
and bitter tea. But notice that I didn't get to these until I'd shown you how you can apply those laws to digestion. When you've been talking about the eight remedies, you've been talking about preventing it from the hydrochloric acid from being depleted. Yeah. But can you also boost it through the eight laws? That's right. You need more water. You need to start having... You need casting off care and anxious thought as you sit to dine. So you've got to turn the tap off. Exercise increases blood supply to the stomach, which increases, which can trigger the more hydrochloric acid because more blood. So can you see that? So that will not only prevent loss, but it'll also help to heal from loss. But you did say that there's a standard and it will do the same every time. That's right, unless you put these in too. But if you don't do that, these aren't going to do much. Because you might do this, but then you keep drinking with your meals so you water it down anyway. So the eight remedies won't boost it. It will just keep it from being depleted. It'll, it'll keep it from being depleted. And once the person stops drinking with their meals and starts drinking uh, between meals, then the betaine will work. So it's not enough to do this. So this will prevent it, and this is an important part of boosting it again. Bitter tea. What is bitter tea? This is the tea that we use. It's. I think we did discuss this in the... Um, yeah, we call it digestive tea. So it's one part... Uh, dandelion, all your bitter herbs. It's one part gentian, one part licorice, and half a part golden seal. Do you remember golden seal's nickname? King of tonics to warm mucous membranes. They're all roots, so you buy them as dried roots, you mix them together in the jar, and remember the rule of thumb, one teaspoon to one cup of water. If you come to Misty Mountain Health Retreat, before every meal you'll get a little quarter or third of a cup of um, hot bitter tea just before the meal. So what that hot bitter tea does is stimulates your parietal glands to release some more of your digestive enzymes and that again can flip the, the brain to, to start making more, you know, giving the message to the liver. Dr. Kellogg said a quarter of a cup of very hot water just before the meal can also bring the blood, yes? I'm just curious though, isn't the body smart enough to produce more hydrochloric acid without those three things, if you're following the eight remedies? If you've, okay, if you've depleted it, and then you start following the eight remedies again, so you're healing, is the body not smart enough to produce more acid without the boost three It things? may, but it may take a lot longer. Yeah, okay. I suffered from anemia for 13 years. I had to take iron tablets. Sometimes I thought I was going really well and I'd stop taking the iron tablets and then I'd go down without me realising it. I even had to be rushed to hospital and given a blood transfusion. The haemoglobin levels in the blood should be between 11 and 15. Um, mine got down to 5 and death is 3. That's when they gave me the blood transfusion. So I. I would diligently look after my body. I do not want that to happen. I went to specialists. I went to naturopaths. They said, you should be eating more protein. They said, you should be eating more dark green leafies. But I'd look at my children. They're eating exactly what I'm eating. So I went to my anatomy and physiology books. And I discovered that iron is bound up in food and it needs acid to free it from food. And having lived with an alcoholic and a drug addict for many years, and especially the last few years were incredibly stressful, I'd lost my hydrochloric acid through the stress. 
how do you know if you've got low hydrochloric acid? It's five hours after you've eaten and you still you feel like you've just eaten. <laughs> I was not getting the iron out of my food because I had low hydrochloric acid. No one had ever discussed that with me. And the other thing I discovered, and one of the reasons they gave me the blood transfusion, is my ferritin. Ferritin is iron stores. So my ferritin levels, which should never go under 26, were three. So the danger of my situation was I had low iron in the blood and I had no stores. So I remember when a doctor rang me up and he said, you've got to get in hospital immediately. You, 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 you have an accident, you're dead because you've got no blood. So it was a crisis there. So I'm thinking, Why, what's, what's going on here? How, how did this happen? And when this happened, I'd already left home with my children. I'd married Michael. It was a happy, happy home. But you know what had happened? My body was in the habit. My body was in the habit of making low hydrochloric acid. My liver was making low hydrochloric acid because it made low yesterday. I didn't know all that. I was keeping all the laws. <laughs> so Julia, sometimes you've got to do something quick. <laughs> I've got to do something quick. I don't want to have blood transfusions. So when I discovered this, that ferritin is iron stores, and you know what iron needs to store it as ferritin? Protein. That's how iron stores as ferritin. It must be with protein. And if your hydrochloric acid levels are low, you're not breaking down your protein. So it all came back to what? This. <laughs> That was the cause of my problem. That was the cause. So I did two things. I made this tea up. And I started having a third of a cup of hot bitter tea before every meal. And I began implementing more legumes. I used to have legumes once or twice a week. I started to have legumes and some nuts every meal. So I boosted my protein intake and I had the bitter tea. After six months, I had another blood test. And I rang up the doctor's surgery and the secretary said, ah, sorry, he's pretty busy. I said, can you give me the results? She said, no, I can't. But I said, you could answer some of my questions, couldn't you? And she said, yes, I could. <laughs> I said, my hemoglobin, is it above eight? Yes. Is it above nine? Yes. Is it above 10? Yes. Is it above 11? It was above 15. <laughs> Highest end of the scale. Now, I'd been living on and off on iron tablets for 13 years. And I was on no iron tablets. I said, aha, tell me my ferritin levels. Is it above 26? Yes, go up higher. <laughs> it was way, way up about 50. Uh, just out of interest sake, what's my B12? High, 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 high. <laughs> what had I done? All I had done was take this bitter tea. And that bitter tea stimulated not only my liver, but also my glands making the enzyme. So can you see the liver's getting the message? I, wasn't, I didn't know about betaine hydrochloride then. So the experience I'm telling you was about, I don't know, 15 years ago. 13 years I struggled with this and six months of eating more protein and boosting my hydrochloric acid. My hair grew long. I started running up hills. I used to wonder why I couldn't walk up hills. I just didn't have a blood, enough blood in me because I, your blood carries as your oxygen. It was that simple. I rarely tell that story, but my husband says, Barbara, it's one of your most powerful stories. <laughs> But I tell it to you as students because you will get people with anemia. Instead of just taking iron tablets, you've got to find out why they've got anemia. Yes? And you didn't need to take the, the same hydrochloride. I didn't know about it. Yeah. And the dandelion is root? root? Yeah. 
Yeah. So those bitter, bitter herbs. Can you see why I love this tea? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and can you see why I wrote a chapter in my book? The stomach's secret weapon, hydrochloric acid. And yet the great deceiver has deceived people into thinking they've got too much acid. There's no such thing. Unless you're a dog, but dogs don't seem to have a problem. Dogs don't get reflux. Dogs don't get stomach ulcers. So we're looking at what happens or what was the cause of the food still being in the stomach eight hours later. Stress. Whenever you're stressed, whenever you're anxious, the hydrochloric acid stops production. That's why I just love that statement from Ellen White. Cast off care and anxious thought as you sit to dine. Alcohol. If he had alcohol with the meal, and how many people do that? That basically inhibited digestion and large fluid with the meal. Now, when our guests first come in, and we had seven guests come in yesterday, Misty Mountain Health Retreat, and they come in and we serve the meal. And we see it all the time. They're looking around for the glasses and the water. And one day we even had a man get up and he said, well, does anyone want, want, want water? And then we're going, yes. And he said, can we have some water, please? They almost think we're being rude. So we smile very nicely and get a jug and water. And we say, we actually advise that you don't drink a lot with your meals because it can hiccup digestion. But we understand you're thirsty. A few mouthfuls will not hurt. And then, of course, when they hear the lectures and they hear why you shouldn't drink with your meals, then they understand. But you've got to have mercy on these people. They've never heard such a thing. They don't know. And it is true, a few mouthfuls will not hurt. <laughs> we had a guy come who was having three glasses of water with every meal. Well, by the end of the week, he was having half a glass. And the student might say, he shouldn't be having any. I said, hey, he's gone from three to half a glass. He's doing well. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. And how many people you will meet that come to your retreat that do all of that? And that's why that story is, is a great story to share. I have a question to the ferritin. Yeah? Um, does it have to be connected to protein? Uh, does the iron have to be connected to protein? That's right. That's how the body stores iron. It stores it as ferritin, but it needs to be bound with protein to store it. And by the way, if you've got too much iron floating around your body, that can feed bacteria. That's why the body likes to store it as ferritin. It's your, it's your stores. I haven't had a blood test for about... 12 years, I suppose. I don't know what it is now, but my energy levels are great. You know, everything works, so I, I don't have one. So let us move on in our journey. I'm stretching this out because I wanted to cover every single point in this. And I'm looking at the clock. I think it's time for us to have a break. So let's have a break and we'll continue. Yes? Can you buy that tea or do you put it together, as you said, one part? Uh, there's only one place you can buy it and that's Misty Mountain Health Retreat. Because <laughs> it's our tea. <laughs> but um, I, did, I did contact Bench and see if Bengt, Bengt. I'm getting it right, Wonderful. Bengt. <laughs> Um, to see if we could get those herbs so you could all try it, but they weren't easy to get. But I'm sure if you, if you diligently try, you'll get them. Yeah. Would it be enough with Artemisia? Would it be enough with? Artemisia. 
I don't know what that is. Chinese um, wood, wood, um, wormwood. Woodwork? Wormwood. Wormwood. Yeah, wormwood. Wormwood's very bitter and the great thing about using wormwood is you'd uh, kill your worms as well.